And then we should have transcription going to, can people see that, that need it? Could somebody give me like a thumbs up or say yes in chat? The transcription option did come up. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I yes. just want to make sure that anybody that needs it has it. Uh, okay, I think. Yeah. Twelve oh one. I'm I'm happy to go ahead and get started. Maureen, do you want to do a bit of an introduction before I? Sure. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Deed 32-Hour um, Workweek Campaign um, Information Session. Um, with us, we have Amber Alton. They are a Deed employee, but they are also active in this 32-Hour Workweek Campaign. Just a little bit of background on this. I just want to make sure that um, people understand that this is a grassroots campaign happening with MAPE members to um, get this to be a negotiations platform thing that gets negotiated in our contract. This is not something coming from deed. This is not something coming from like MAPE Central to impose to like send out to anybody. This is a grassroots effort that we're trying to get people involved in. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to Amber, give them a chance to introduce themselves and um, talk a little bit about um, what they're going to present to us. And if you want me to come in at any time or explain anything, Amber, or hit, you know, ask for Michael to be here, do that as well. We'll watch the chat, watch for questions and things like that as we go. Cool. Thanks so much, uh, Maureen. I've put um, in the chat, and I'll drop it again for folks who have just joined, uh, the link to uh, the link to the deck that I'm going to um, be talking through. Um, um, so that if folks want to follow along, that they can. Um, I cannot see the full list of participants, um, so I can't see who all is here. But for those who I haven't met, um, my name is Amber Alton, and I'm an innovation consultant on the customer innovation team here uh, at Deed. Um, and I am also uh, involved with the the 32 hour uh, work week campaign. So um, what I'm going to do today is talk um, talk a bit about the movement and and um, uh, um, and demonstrate why why this work is important uh, and um, and some of the actions that are happening around it. Um, it's really our hope with this um, information session to better inform folks about um, about the campaign, about what's happening. Um, did send in a master contract proposal for a 34 hour work week. Okay, uh, just reading the chat here. Um, so we are, so Maureen, Maureen and I are excited to, to, to host this information session and to answer any questions um, and to provide information. So as I'm going through um, the slides, I'll also have the chat open. Um, so if there are questions or things that aren't clear as I'm walking through this, please feel free to, to ask those questions. There'll also be space for um, Q&A at the end uh, of the deck. Um, yeah, anything, anything else you want to cover before I get started, Maureen? No, I think you did a pretty good job of introducing this. I'm excited to um, talk more about this with folks at the end of this to find out what questions you might have. Cool. Cool. So I think it's important to get started with a strong um, a strong goal statement uh, to really make clear what um, what the goal of this movement is. Uh, and so the goal is to establish a 32 hour work week with no pay or benefit reductions in the 2025 uh, contract negotiations. Um, and I, I really love this goal statement because I think it it so perfectly and succinctly captures what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, we are trying to permanently move uh, from the 40 hour work week to a 32 hour work week as being full time work, but with absolutely no pay or benefit reductions uh, in the upcoming contract cycle. Um, uh, for for uh, this this work has primarily been focused in MAPE, but we are also working to collaborate with um, other unions that are that represent state workers, including AFSCME, including MMA, um, 
um, though the work that um, Maureen and I are involved with is primarily focused uh, in MAPE. Um, and so I, I, I think that um, as you're thinking about what this movement is and what it wants to do, I will always uh, bring folks back to this to this goal statement because I think it really clearly outlines uh, what the work that it is that we're trying to do. And so I think the the next question that flows from that is why thirty right. Um, so there is a there is a growing movement uh, in the U.S. and beyond to shift to a thirty two hour work week in response to increased productivity. Um, so many of us are are familiar with the forty hour work week as being normal and being what's standard. Um, but you know, and as I'll show here in a minute, you know, we've had the forty two hour work week, the forty hour work week for a really long time, uh, and we haven't um, moved to address uh, how how work has shifted and how it's changed and what the different dynamics are. And so we in this movement are advocating for a thirty two hour work week because um, we all believe that time is as important a benefit as pay, as health benefits, as retirement, and as PTO, right? Because, um, you know, think about what you could do with an extra eight hours in your week, right? How much how much more time could you spend with your loved ones? How much more time could you spend uh, taking, you know, doing care work for children or for parents? And so really this movement, movement is, is about um, recognizing the, the, the changing and the shifting dynamics of, of what work is uh, and updating our, our work week to be responsive to that. And so, you know, just as I talked about, you know, what, what folks could do with some of that extra time, uh, you know, there are, there are so many benefits associated with the 32 hour work week. Among them is reduced burnout, right? It's more time, um, for, uh, for us to recover from, from, from the important and intensive work we do to make, um, to deliver services in this state, right? It could give us more time, um, uh, and reduce the burnout that so many of us feel. We get some of our lives back. Um, you know, the a 32 hour work week would work out to an extra 52 days off per year, right? Um, you know, as Michael, as Michael uh, put in chat, uh, it would give us more time to get, it would give him more time to get back into exercising more regularly. Um, being in office kind of killed that limited capacity um, Jack has also noted that Jack's asking a question here that's saying, if we worked a 32-hour work week, would we receive OT for anything over 32, or will we still have to take flex time? Um, that's a really important question. Maureen, do you want to address it now, or do you want to wait until the end? Let's address it now. Um, okay. Well, the way that the contract um, is currently written, you know, overtime comes in at different um, times. And um, so the way overtime works out, it is based on a 40 hour week, it would have to change to a 32 hour week. But you know, sometimes exempt employees still have to balance, right? Um, because they don't get paid overtime for anything over 32 or 40 hours, you know, at the way it sits right now. So unless we change some of that language too, you know, there'd mm -hmm. still be that balancing aspect of the hours, especially for exempt folks. But um, anybody in a non-exempt position that was asked to work more than their scheduled hours, you know, right. and that met the other things under the contract would theoretically get um overtime after 32 hours, you know, as long as they didn't have like sick leave or something in there that, you know, right. went against their um, 32 hours. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I think, um, Maureen, what you're saying, and Greg, since we are hourly and not salary, will we get paid for only 32 hours per week? So, Greg, that's a good question. So, and I think it builds off of Jack's questions. What would happen ideally is that weight your your um your hourly wage would be raised so that you would be only being paid for thirty two hours thirty two hours per week, but it would be still equivalent to working forty hours per week. So, so to answer your question, yes, but the wage itself would go up. So then the value of those thirty two hours would be more. And so, um, and then in response to Jack's question, um. 
And then in response to Jack's question, right, so um, much as it exists today, you get paid for working over 40 hours because that is what your standard is. So in this model, you would again still be paid for working over 32 hours because that would be considered full time. Uh, Jim, any agencies, departments, other companies successfully doing this um, and utilizing their experiences? That is a great question. I have a slide about this very thing. So uh, let me let me finish working through this a little bit and I will uh, provide you an answer to that. But the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. So again, talking th talking through the 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 benefits of this um, or to finish out that conversation. Um, Another benefit of the 32-hour work week is that it is a, a recruitment uh, tool. Um, you know, you can you can attract and better retain your employees when you are providing them uh, more time. Um, uh, when you are when you are providing them more time and, and reducing the amount of hours they're working per week. And so, I know that some of you. Um, might feel skeptical, right? And say like, well, like 40 hours is what we do, right? Like how do we how do we do anything differently, right? And I, I wanna just draw folks' attention that like to the fact that the the 40 hour well, work I'm trying this... to get my earbuds to work and I can't even get them down on the computer. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh sorry. Um so for so many of us, we we sort of think of the 40 hour work week uh as being just what it is that we do right that it's just standard and like there's no other way we've, we've done this but in the context of our history it's actually still something that's relatively new right and why we have the 40 hours is because people fought for that right they fought for the right um to have um let to to have less hours right um and still um and still have their pay and so this this um this graphic from um the times uh, from this article in the times in 1937 really really demonstrates um re really demonstrates that history that we're talking about and and also this uh this timeline i think really shows um a really really good example of of how the movement worked to build um work to build up to the 40 hour work week, right? Because this wasn't just a thing that happened because work, because uh, employers decided to be benevolent or that they would like people to not be dying on their shop floors, right? But instead this is a response to the labor movement's work to really push for that, uh, to, to give people their time back. And, and so to to uh, sorry to to Jen's point earlier, um, you know, if there are there agencies, departments, or companies doing this, right? Um, we know the 32 hour work week is possible because it's happening all across the United States, right? This is not, um, uh, you know, this is not a uh, a niche or a um, uh, a sort of far out proposition. Like this is work that is happening today. Um, so, um, you know, putting together this timeline showing, we put together this timeline showing different um, countries, different organizations and companies and departments that have implemented a 32 hour work week. Um, and we can see here um, um, the diversity of the types of companies. So Cindy, I see your question here. Can you give an example of the type of companies who've implemented this? Um, has this been in the private sector or has it occurred in the public sector? So you can see from this timeline, the city of Newburgh Heights uh, in Ohio, the Golden Colorado Police Department, right? So we're seeing the, the Carleton School District in Minnesota, right? We are seeing the 32 hour work week happen in both the public and the private sector. And this 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 graphic is one that I screenshotted last week. Um, I was uh, scrolling on Instagram probably when I was fucking off at work or something, and I saw this job ad uh, for uh, the vice president of finance for a for an organization called Nexus Community Partners, um, uh, called Nexus Community Partners. Um, that's based in St. Paul, Minnesota, that's offering a, a full-time salary to their vice president of finance at 32 hours a week, right? So these there are jobs being posted today actively in this state where people are expected to work 32 hours as the, as the norm, 
right? And so I think that these examples highlight um, the the way in which people, the, the way in which both companies, both in the public and the private sector, are able to reduce the number of full-time hours that people are working and still be able to operate successfully. And Cassie, I see your point in the chat um, uh, where there's some skepticism around um, the 32-hour work, the 32-hour work week in the Carleton School District. Uh, and I think the thing that I would maybe highlight there is that you know there wasn't that long ago where a four-day school week. Uh, uh, was a was a sort of proposition that people couldn't imagine. Uh, but I imagine that still teachers are able to do the work that um, uh, that that needs to be done in that space, right? And even like recognizing what giving that extra day back could mean for teachers and for students, I think is important. And so, in some of these organizations um, that have done trials of the 32 hour work week to see how that work, um, um, in the in the results of the 32 hour work week trials, we've seen that in both positive um, uh, positive outcomes for both employers and employees. So employees are experienced less burnout, less stress. Um, better physical and mental health, and the vast majority of them would like to continue uh, working that 32-hour work week. And for employers, they saw, they see an increase in their revenue, they've seen a decrease in resignations and absenteeism, uh, and again, the vast majority um, of the employers who have, who have, can, who have participated in 32-hour work week trials have continued past the pilot. And so um, I'm not sure if I am. Sometimes I have to make sure that I enable the sound separately. So when yeah. you share, just make sure that, that that's enabled yeah. and you should be okay. Yeah, I don't actually, so I think, so again, I've, I've put the link to the deck in the chat, and so th what what this video is is um, uh, it is a it is a case study of the 32 hour work week uh, for the Golden Police Department that's based in Colorado. Um, and so I really I highly encourage folks to to watch this video uh, on their own time. But the the and it's only about four or five minutes. It's very short. Uh, but the 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 synthesis of this trial is that the the police officers working. Uh, in the Golden Colorado Police Department, saw more time for their families. I remember there's a there's a cop in here who talks about being able to pick his kids up from school uh, every day uh, because he only is only has to work the 32 hour work week. They've seen um, higher retention and overall just better and less stress in the police officers uh, who have who are uh, who have, were part of that 32 hour work week trial. And so I should I think and I think that this example. It's such a strong one because I think we all think of, um, you know, I think some of us might think that, you know, the police going down the 32 hour work, a 32 hour work week might really have a significant impact uh, on our safety. Um, but as this example shows, it, it's able, we're, you know, the, this department was able to do, to implement that 32 hour work week with no impact to safety in the city, right? There, there was no, um, uh, you know, they didn't experience the sort of challenges that, that you might make up in your head around what things could happen. And so I'm seeing there's some questions in the chat, so I'm going to pause to read them. So Sharon asked the question, and I'll voice over it. She says, I'm wondering how this would affect getting work done. Would more people have to be hired to make up the lost time? Or am I missing something here? Maureen, I love you. I love I love and, and Michael, I see you too as well in the chat. I'd love for you to chime in here. Um, but I think my initial reaction to that is, is 
Um, if, and, and I see a, a response to that is like, there's already this work that needs to get done and it's remaining unfinished. And I think I think about that from, not from an employee perspective, but from an employee, but from the employer's stance, right? Why are you in a, why are you in a situation where you can't get the amount of work done that you need to in the, in that period of time? And it really doesn't feel like it's about whether it's 32 or 40 hours, but it's instead about shifting around, it's about shifting around those priorities. Michael, I'll let you jump in here to answer that question, though. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think about, too, that I think we all maybe need to be a little bit more critical about as we reflect on our work week is, you know, for ex the thing I like to say is there's those meetings that could have been emails, right? But how about those emails that just couldn't have been? I think we are oftentimes finding ourselves more and more, especially as technology has progressed so far, doing work that isn't necessarily mission critical, but is like our bosses want us to do it. And so I think part of having a 32 hour work week necessarily includes having critical conversations about what are what work is necessary to our unit's mm -hmm. mission and what work isn't. Because like, mm -hmm. I mean, I can say, you know, for example, in the last week, in this week alone, I have been in at least three or four hours of meetings that definitely could have been emails. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, in terms of concerns about budget, taxpayer money, or, uh, and things like that, I think it's worth considering too that one of the things that we um, are, one of the things that this has an advantage of is that it doesn't necessarily require an increase to worker pay which we understand, you know, we're, uh, that budgetary circumstances will be quite different now than they've been in the past. How, and so with that said, you know, looking at our hours of work is one concrete way that the employer can continue to improve our material conditions without necessarily having to invest more money. It might still happen, right, because there might need to be additional staffing. But the argument is maybe those places should have been staffed at the right level to begin with. Because, like, I know, for example, VRS has already um, said they're looking at a hiring freeze, even though I know many of you as counselors have said that, you know, you need that additional support from more counselors. And so I think part of it is just also to us negotiating with our, us negotiating and building our power. One other thing, one other thing I'll just mention as well is that, um, so uh, is that there was one person who had mentioned, you know, could we do 35 instead? I think, you know, the specific 32 is what most folks have tried. It'll be a negotiations process, right? And so what I would encourage you to maybe do is maybe work with the group and see, you know, if they, if we do get to the realm of starting to produce counter offers to management, maybe that's something we could work on together. Thanks for that, Michael. And so I'll... Go forward here. So I'll talk a bit. So what I've talked to uh, talked about up until this point is um, around some of the why of the 32 hours and where uh, and where this work has been implemented. And so now I'll talk about um, the the sort of structure of the campaign that as it's taking shape at MAPE and some of the work that's happening um, uh, to build to build uh, power and pressure for the 32 hour work week. So uh, we have a messaging team um, whose goal is working on developing targeted messaging to deliver uh, deliver the narrative of a 32-hour work week to answer many of the questions that we are addressing here today um, and really to um, uh, 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 and really to uh, p build the power and the pressure um, to, to push this movement forward. There's a data and systems team that's using systems and different technologies to deliver, disseminate and deliver uh, a data-driven message. There's a relational organizing team that uh, is focused on um, building leaders in every region to, to take some of these actions and build power. There's an event planning team that's focused on holding events uh, to connect um, groups across Minnesota um, to share information. Uh, and then there's a union coalition team um, um, that is focused on um, uh, 
connecting with uh, other unions outside of MAPE to build strength and align priorities. So this looks like working with AFSCME and MMA and other uh, unions around the state to work to, to, to build the power across all of these unions. So Sam, I see you have a question that Michael has Michael has answered, but I think it's a good one, so I'll say it aloud. Um, so Sam asked, "What would a 32-hour work week look like? Working only six hours per day instead of eight. Working only four hours per week. Would everyone be taking the same days off if we were doing it four days per week?" Um, and then Michael has a Michael's response to this, which I also think is good, says. Um, this will likely differ based on department business needs. Some might do a whole day off, others might just cut time off for the existing days. Um, and so, uh, and I think that's a that's a really good point. Um, what that 32 hour work week looks like, there ideally would be flexibility there for um, for departments to do what makes sense for them. You know, because we can we know that there are some departments, you know, for example, like UI um, that takes phone calls, and so you need that you need that staffing throughout the week, and so then you would have um, just the ability for folks to be able for different departments. Um, to to really flex to be to meet their business needs. Uh, and yes, Kathy, the the uh, the intent is to um, for this to be across the board, across the state, across the state enterprise. And so, also want to show a bit of um, to talk a bit about what this timeline looks for, uh, for for pushing for the 32 hour work week. So what I'll draw your attention to is the furthest right part of the screen. So June 30th, 2025, um, um, so June 30th, 2025 is when the contract would expire, when our current contract expires. And so all of the work then to the left of that is working to build power, um, uh, uh, ahead of those contract negotiations. So what we're doing now is working to advocate for the 32-hour work week uh, ahead of delegate assembly and, head, and ahead of the negotiator convention, um, which are um, both of those things are our sort of governing bodies of MAP where priorities for, for upcoming contract ne negotiations are decided. Um, and then, go ahead, Maureen. Um, we just had the negotiations convention and I will say that it went over fairly well there. Okay. Um, you know, Perfect. it. lots of people mentioned it as something that they were hearing as a priority, either in their region or with the meet and confer chairs in their um, agency. So you guys are doing a very good job of getting the word out. I just wanted to point that out. Michael, I'd love for you to, if you could, if you're willing to come off mute um, and respond uh, and voice over the response that you just gave to, to Nisha's question. Because I think... Many other folks will have the same one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth remembering that for the most part, I think pretty much all MAPE, I'm a 14L, which is near the top end of what MAPE positions pay, and I'm hourly. Like, pretty much, there's a difference between being exempt from one and a half time pay for overtime and being salaried, and I think we often conflate those, where you could be exempt from that overtime rate, but you're still not salaried, right? Because you still get overtime. That's the thing. Our contract says that if you are exempt... You know, you're, um, you can either balance the hours, which is what MMB and management chooses. But for example, when I was at the health department, they gave us overtime when we were responding to COVID because we, we were working those hours. So I think, you know, what it does, it, what it does for us as hourly employees is it raises our hourly pay, but the annual pay would stay the same, which is really how MMB does a lot of its budgeting for positions, is they'll do an estimate of the number of hours that they'll work per year, um, and a, based on like full-time status, part-time status, whatever. Um, I think one thing that's also worth mentioning as well is like, I think some folks are, you know, we're state employees, we have we have a public perception. I think it's worth remembering too that like, regardless of what we do, there's always going to be a powerful and vocal constituency that a disapproves of us getting anything. I think it's worth remembering that two contracts ago, when our raises were a lot less generous than what we got in the last contract, um, our legislature tried to veto the raises that we got. 
And it was determined that they weren't allowed to do that, but it was a political move to do that. And those races, mm -hmm. while they were what, the best, I would still say they were the best we could get at the time, they were by no means like super generous races. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just always worth remembering that people will always complain. And I think our mm -hmm. role is to bring them on with, and we can use the story of paid family medical leave as part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to kind of jump on board with this, that is one of the things probably I hear the most is concern about backlash or concern about us being um, looked at as like lazy people who want to work 80% less. But part of the framing of this that we need to be really consistent about is any place this has been done, productivity has gone up. So there is a win-win on this for the employer. It's not just for us. Um, and that is what we would need to lead with. That is the messaging we would need to be having. And we would need to be super consistent in that messaging while we're organizing. Because, you know, it, it is true that the productivity did not drop at all in Golden, Colorado, at the police department, something that has, you know, a very public perception as well. And actually, the community felt more served by them after they um, took on the 32-hour work week. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, and I will just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll echo what you, what you both are saying and that, you know, none of the, none of the, none of the rights that workers have won have ever been popular at the time, at the time in which people were fighting for them, right? Not the 42 hour work week, not child labor standards, right? Because it is always, there are always going to be powerful forces who are working uh, um, and, who are, um, and who are vocalizing and actively against um, employees, particularly state employees, getting any sort of, any sort of benefits. Right, um, and this this is true about pay raises. It's it, right. It's true about everything, right? And so, and and I don't say that to dismiss those concerns because again, those concerns are very valid. And the and the thirty two hour work week messaging campaign is um, is really mindful of that and is really working to cultivate and craft a message um, uh, that it, that addresses some of. The with is that if we only tried to do things that were popular or that people were going to like and that wouldn't sort of um, result in any sort of negative attention, right, we would all still be working 80-hour days with no breaks, right? We, like, that's the, that's the place we would be in. And so um, I, I think it's so important. And while, so yes, while I, while I do think those concerns are important, I also just want to, like, highlight that, um uh, workers' rights in this country have always been uh, a hard-fought battle. So uh, I'll I'll talk now a bit about some of the work that's already happened that's already happening within MAPE around the 32-hour work week. Um, and so to some of these questions that we've been talking about around exempt versus non-exempt employees, there is a work group that's specifically focused on. Um, uh, on thinking about the 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 unique differences between exempt and non-exempt employees, so that we really can make this movement work for everyone within MAPE, salaried, non-salaried, um, right? We um, uh, there's um, we do not want to create a hierarchy within the 32-hour work week where some people get to benefit and others don't, right? Um, and so that work group is doing um, it, it is really doing doing great work. Um, we've also had, um, Marine and Marine put the letter of support in the chat. Over 10% of MAPE represented workers have signed this letter of support. And so to the question that I'm seeing in the chat around, have we discussed this with broader uh, MAPE members to get buy-in? Uh, absolutely. We, we, we're hosting information sessions like this across uh, across the state enterprise, across different agencies, um, and um, and every day more and more folks are signing onto the letter of support to say that they want this to be a priority ahead of the contract negotiations. Um, and then the 32-hour work week has also been added to MAPE's legislative agenda, which is a really important win. Um, uh, I'm thinking about how we push this work forward. Mm -hmm. We also, uh, what, 
three weeks ago now, uh, uh, held an organizing summit uh, on um, the uh, on September 21st uh, at the Roseville Library. Um, there were probably around 50 or 60 of us uh, in the room. We were joined by a representative from the Minnesota State Legislature um, who, who spoke in support of our movement and is going to be a really important ally for helping us to, um, to, to win over legislators and, and, um, uh, and get them on our side. Uh, and we really worked to craft the strategy around how we're going to push this movement forward. So talked about our messaging goals how we were going to build coalitions with um, uh, with uh, with other unions. It was a really um, it was such an energizing day, and there was so and I don't think these pictures adequately captured the energy that was in uh, that was in the space. But I think it was really a great demonstration, and this doesn't even capture the the full entirety of the room. But there were so there were so many people who came across who came together from so many different agencies to help uh, push this work forward. Really demonstrating that there is um, power and energy in, in this movement. Oh, Maureen, thank you. Amanda Hemmingson Yeager, that's her name. I, don't, I can remember. Um, uh, and so if you, um, if, if this movement and if this, and if the 32 hour work week is something that, um, you are interested in and passionate about. There are so many ways for you to get involved. Um, and again, I'm going to um, drop the link to this deck uh, in the chat. Um, you can uh, click the links here. You can learn more about the 32 hour work week movement, including seeing the, the FAQ, which addresses some of the, the questions that we've seen here today. Um, we are also going to have another organizing summit that is uh, virtual uh, in, in, the, in, in the evening uh, so that more people are able to, to join us. Um, you can do what uh, me, Marina, and Michael are doing. You, you can host an information session to, um, to inform folks and to, to um, help them and to answer some of these questions. Uh, you can or organize a negotiator visit, which is um, meeting with your local negotiator to um, press them to support the 32-hour work week. Um, and then you can sign the letter of support, which Maureen has also put into the chat. Um, uh, and again, that that, 30, that letter of support um, is 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 such an important tool that we have to really show um, the contract negotiators to show MMB that, that this is a priority for MATE members and that this is a thing um, that people are passionate about and wanna see uh, in the next round of contract negotiations. And so I know there's already been uh, a ton of a ton of questions so far, um, but just wanna open up space for people to feel free to come off of mute or type in the chat. Uh, questions that they might have, any or any responses, feedback. Um, uh, really, just hoping to 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 have a conversation so that folks feel like they're walking away from this conversation with feeling informed and feeling like they maybe have some next steps. While you're thinking about that, um, those of you that are here, do you have friends that couldn't make it? Do you think we should try to do this again in a couple weeks for Deed? Like, I don't want to saturate people, but I'd be happy to host another one of these. Thanks. Oh. You can definitely forward the information and share the recording, Alana. For um, sure. I think what we'll try to do is maybe get it posted on the Deed Meet and Confers website on the MAPE webpage as well. Mm -hmm. we'll try <laughs> um, I thought I saw a hand but then it was gone okay that person wants to ask a question keep it up a little longer so I can see you <laughs> so. yeah that's a that's a publicly posted um, website if we post it at the deed meet confer anybody can go to MAPE's website and see it there so yes.
Well, I thank you for taking your time to come for this. Um, I make no um, promises that, yes, we'll get this this round, but it, I think it's a worthy fight, and I think it's something that even if we move the needle some, that just gets us that much closer to getting it next round, you know? But, um, you know, we have to start somewhere, and it is where the country is moving towards, And um, we would be the biggest um, group of people to win this if we did. And so it would really help it um, move out to other areas, too, if we did this. So it would be a form of common good bargaining as well. I see a question from someone in the chat. Any surveys have been done to get an idea of how Minnesotans feel about 32 hours work week, or did I miss that info? Um, Michael, there is an organization. Um, uh, it's the 32 hour work week. It's the person who spoke at the organizing summit, Marina, whose name I is absolutely oh, sure. me. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I feel, I want to say yes, but I cannot say so definitively. And so, um, and so I won't, but um, I, I think this builds on the last, um, the last thing I saw, which is that someone said they fear that government employees asking for a 32 hour work week will irritate those citizens who work 40 hours. Uh, and so two responses to this. First, we don't negotiate with, um, uh, with the public. We negotiate with MNB. Second, I think it's, and again, I think back to the point that both I and Maureen and Michael raised um, just, a, just a minute ago, um, you know, uh, doing, doing the things that build worker power, that um, get workers the, the rights that they uh, have earned and are fighting for uh, is sometimes not always popular with uh, the public and is oftentimes not popular uh, in the times where people are working to build that power. Um, but again, as Maureen said, it's about um, working toward a, a different and better future. And, and we truly believe that we can bring those people along. And we had conversations about this uh, during the, the organizing summit around how we, how we work to build Build, um, uh, build public support for this campaign. Michael, I saw your hand go up and then go back down. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think another thing that's also worth remembering is that we've done similar things in this state before. Mm -hmm. um, it's worth remembering paid parental leave or paid family medical leave, excuse me. That was a member driven campaign. And they also, it was a member driven campaign that probably had people with negative opinions in positions of power about it. There are still people, even in our state, right, that believe that if you have to, if you have to take care of a family member and you're out of, you know, sick time, well, you're SOL. You got, you got to take unpaid time and mm -hmm. heaven forbid you're poor. Um, and so I think it's just worth remembering that like, while the, again, there will always be people who kind of oppose any expansion to worker rights. Um, mm -hmm. But we as the state, we as state workers have been able to lead the state in the past through things like the paid family medical leave. Mm -hmm. Now everyone gets it. Um, mm -hmm. That's a pretty much everyone, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but like, that's been huge. Uh, I mean, Juanita, the paid family medical leave did that we did start that. That was like. But anyway, was like we are mm -hmm. reaching, there is coalition building that's happening. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the point just is, is we have the opportunity to do this and I think we have the power and the interest. And so I think that's why we're doing it at this moment. Uh, this is Rob, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Robert. So what if MNB says, sure, we'll give you the 32 hour work week, but everybody has to go back to the office. No more telecommute, telework. Well, that they have difficulty with that. We have some agencies that don't even have space for the people they have. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I know I'm one of them. Yeah. So, you know, the, rea the reality is they can't, I mean, yes, they could do that, but we, one, don't have to accept anything. We don't have to say, oh, yes, we will take that. But two, they don't have any place to put, like, most of revenue, 
a good portion of DHS, um, some of our own agency. Um, you know, Patty, earlier you said, you know, 40% of the people, 40% of the time, you know, they can't, they can only telework. That's UI that, and basically only UI that's in 40%, you know, that's only able to telework 40% of the time. A good portion mm -hmm. of our agency doesn't even have a place to sit if they tried to come into the office. Yeah. Michael. <laughs> good point. I think another thing that's worth mentioning is, yeah, I I think we can get lost in hypotheticals and don't get mm -hmm. me wrong, MMB is a jerk, but they would never propose that. And the reason why mm -hmm. they would never propose that is because MMB style is to leave things vague. They would rather try to weaken existing language than just try to get rid of it entirely. That's just not they they just that's just not how it would work. And I think we always have to kind of course correct ourselves because we can get stuck in like some of those what ifs. That won't happen. But let's say they choose something else. Let's say, you know, a thing they've constantly tried to get is the ability to take steps away from us as discipline. I do not think our negotiations team is mm -hmm. in the interest of do of accepting poison pills for a benefit like this because they I'm pretty I feel pretty confident as a former negotiator. And I think Maureen, as another current and former negotiator, would agree that like they're not going to try to do a proposal like that that is intentionally meant to divide our union. Hmm. Ooh, they sometimes do divisive ones, but we have that ability to say no. Yeah. Well, no, that like our team wouldn't accept that one that's like right. intentionally meant to divide our union. That is correct. And I mean, we didn't back down on SERP when that was um, that's the corrections early retirement program. For those of you that might not be aware of that, even though that affected a small portion of people, because that's not what you do. You don't leave your brothers hmm. and sisters behind. So um, we wouldn't be trying to make it worse for anyone else to get a benefit. Hmm. I'll also just say, too, as a board member who has one of the first like votes on if we accept the contract or not after the negotiations team, I wouldn't accept I wouldn't vote to accept a contract that had 32 hours with a significant poison pill like that. Yeah. And I wouldn't vote Rob, to accept it today for that. Yeah. You made a good point. I didn't think about <clears throat> we, us choosing not to accept it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm just a little skeptical. I, I'm sure a lot of people are. Sure. It's just how are we going to take what the work we do in 40 hours and turn it into 32? And, you know, I know that some of it is politics at the end, that some of the people mm -hmm. questions that people ask, but I think that's the part that's the most skeptical. It'd be nice. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. I mean, I do four tens right now. So it'd be great to not have to stress out trying to get that extra, extra day in, 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 in a week. Mm -hmm. So I totally get it. It Robert would be nice. Robert, you said you said you're skeptical. Can you say more as to why? I just I'm hesitant to to see how this is going to move forward. And and mm. part of it is I'm it's not that I'm negative. It's just I I know that management wants to pound out as much work, excuse me, into us in the in the mm. um minimum amount of time possible so that they don't have to pay so sure. <clears throat> 40 hours a week is what our contract says and it's our positions mm -hmm. and they may say well you know sure you can do 30 hours a week but you only get 80 percent pay and i certainly uh, couldn't uh, afford that i know again, that isn't what we're asking no, for. but we would never yep and we would never i know that, that. Yep. Mm -hmm. i know that but it's just it's going to be a hard sell I guess is right. what I'm getting at. Um, you know, it, it's just, I'm just, I'm just skeptical, skeptical right. about it. Cause I, I have a lot of work to do. I've got 50 right. some odd people on my caseload mm -hmm. and trying to cram all that in, in less hours is, is just even mm -hmm. harder. Weber, I, I will, I wonder if like, it doesn't sound like you yourself are skeptical. It sounds like you would be like, yeah, I would love that. It I, sounds I like would love it. Right. But I'm, but, I'm, so it, I'm, it sounds like we. But it sounds like, it sounds like then what you where your skepticism is coming from is um, how we get there, maybe. Yeah. Or like maybe how it happens. 
right? How it happens. Which is a, yeah. Right, which is totally, which is totally understandable. And I think that would I would I I would point you back to to history, and I think that for some folks, like history can just seem like so long ago, or that it doesn't matter today. Um, but like I think the same the same questions you're raising. Are, are many of the same questions and and not just you I've like seen we you know we've seen this um uh throughout this conversation right like this is possible right and like it doesn't and it doesn't mean that we just go to a 32 hour work because without discussions about how the about how that work gets done um but I would encourage you that like you know the the questions you you are you if I don't know, it sort of feels like to me the questions that you're concerned about are questions that our employer needs to be solving for, not the things that we need to be solving for with our time, right? It sounds like they, it sounds like there's not an effective management of the of of your workload and about the work that we are doing, right? Um, and so I I think that like, um. Yeah, so I think that like skepticism in the way that you're expressing it totally makes sense to me. Um, but I don't. But like, yeah, I was just like, I, I think something I was hearing was like, I don't know if you you sound skeptical. It would be nice. I'm just, I guess, the skeptical part is whether MMB would even agree to it in the future. I, obviously, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to come around this this turn. But mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. It's just that's a huge paradigm shift. Mm. And I mean, I'm 45 years old. I've I've, I've been an adult for 25 years, give or take. Mm. So it just seems mm -hmm. unimaginable to me. And I'm not being negative. I, I assure you, I would love it. Mm. Don't get me wrong. I just don't know if that's something in mm. our current dynamic you know, I think Americans work way more hours than probably the rest of the world. Mm. And we have to start somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> so maybe instead of 32, it's 35. I don't know. But mm. something, it, it, it's not wrong to push for it because you have to mm. start somewhere like you guys. Said. And, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, what happened 100, 150 years ago with with union, you know, with people banding together to to represent to gain representation so that they can negotiate and we have to start somewhere so i totally respect that and i'm glad that you guys are moving forward with this you know you have to start at the grassroots level mm -hmm. so having a meeting like this is 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 smart and appropriate thanks Robert. i totally like, get to your concerns i think you know it's one thing too when like um we're doing this and there's like no history. Right. But I think again, we just mm. have to remember we've done the, we've done things that seem impossible like this before mm. that now we can't think of a world without it. I keep going back to paid family medical leave just because it's mm. such an important and member driven campaign that we were able to get this benefit that like, I'm sure people were like, you know, what are non-state staff going to say about the fact that we get additional paid sick mm. time to take care of, to like take care of our family when they don't get any, maybe even paid, even parental leave. Well, they do starting next year. Exactly. Right. And so, uh, but and it's you got to start somewhere. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I think, you know, <laughs> it's natural to feel like, is this even possible? But I think it's also just worth remembering too, that we've done the what seemed impossible before and that mm -hmm. with member power, or yeah, they said we couldn't work remotely. Right. Um, I remember seven years ago when I first started, I was working one day a week in the off. I was working one day a week remotely and I had to fight for that. Like I, oh, had to I, show that I was doing above 40 hours worth of productivity, et cetera. And so I think, you know, now and now I'm I'm working much more remote. And so I think as we feel those like, can it be done? I think we can just remind ourselves that we are a powerful union. And when we come together and can fight for something together, we can accomplish things that maybe we thought were impossible. This is true. I think someone else has their hand up as well. Go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Chris. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, I don't believe any of our negotiations with them would 
You sound really far away, and I'm having a lot of difficulty hearing you. Is the uh, unemployment or uh, MMB, uh, none of our requests are ever easy. Mm. Um, but if they don't get made, nothing changes. So I'm just kind of hoping that, uh, I believe it was Robert, that he understands that that's, there has to be a start of it if you want it. So. Us doing thanks. this advocacy is, doing. yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Go ahead. No, thanks for what you guys been doing. Yeah. So the start of this campaign and this advocacy is part of the ways that we do that paradigm shift. And as we keep building it, there will be more concrete ways to do this. I mean, there will need to be contract language that's written. There will need to be contract language that's written to like support it in other ways, you know, making sure that, um, you know, over time doesn't go crazy for exempt folks and things like that. So there are things that would have to happen to make this happen, but we just work towards doing that. If we don't get it this time, maybe next time. It is one of those things where if we don't start somewhere, it won't happen. And it is something that I do believe there is a movement nas nationwide for that to happen. Um, there are studies out there, they're published, about productivity going up when um, the hours go down. And I know people are worried about their clients and their caseload and things like that. Um, nobody's going to neglect their clients or their caseload. But that's also, you know, something that we should be addressing on a separate level. Why are your caseloads overloaded now? Mm -hmm. You know, and what can we do to get that addressed? Because staying at 40 hours isn't going to fix it either. And those mm -hmm. are kinds of things that we need to be fixing. Um, this isn't a one issue thing. You know, this is... Um, making the workplace better for everybody. And honestly, hoping that the rest of Minnesota follows. It isn't like we want to be the only people that are like this. This should be the way that things are done for everyone. And I do think it's inevitable eventually. Yeah. Just the eventually, how long ago from now is that going to be? And what can we do to move that needle? Yes. Let's try to get some um, work done on people who are, are currently overworked and having trouble serving their clients because that's something that we should be helping with now. We don't need to wait for the next contract. Right. Um, and so I think, oh, okay. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just want to reemphasize again, no one in this room, like none of us are paid enough to be giving our boss consistent mandatory unpaid overtime <laughs> and so please if you are currently in a situation where you're like i'm overworked i'm burning out you have a right to a workload meet and confer and we can work with you on that so please reach out to us so i see that we are coming up on on time um thank you all so much for for spending this hour with us um if you all have other questions, uh, please feel free. Um, you know, I, I can speak for myself. I'm always happy to 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 chat. You can find me. Uh, same for Maureen, and I'm. Uh, I would probably say the same for Michael as well. Um, if you have specific questions about uh, to be direct, to be directed at the campaign, uh, there is a Gmail email address that um, uh, is routinely checked. Um, and we, I, we also saw some interest in maybe um, having another one of these sessions. So uh, maybe look out for a calendar invite for that as well. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Maureen and Michael, can you both chat? Yeah, for just a minute. Yeah. We'll wait for folks to hop off. I'll just stick people in the waiting room. Cool.
so it may have walked away. Right, that's what I'm thinking. One person were just like looking at their bedroom or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if they had us and they're just like listening to us while we're while they're working, they might have you know had to Yeah. do something. So I'll just put everybody. Oh yeah, no, they're like like okay. <laughs> Okay. How did that go for you guys? Good. Thank you for being willing to step up and do that. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I expected the kind of pushback that we got. I Yeah. mean, people feel a certain It's way a about serving their clients and there's a lot yeah. of client serving folks in Right. our agency. Yep. It's so hard for me. Like it's I like I could tell during that meeting I was just like, what the like like because I'm like it's like And I think, and I, I, I'm, and I'm so glad that like Robert came off of off of mute, and I think like, uh, we have talking through it. But it's just like, yeah, people are just like, well, I can't imagine this working. So like, I don't know if it's a good idea. And it's like, what are you talking like? What like? Do you think that like, 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 it, yeah, I don't know. It's like people, and I know it's like whatever. We're not teaching this in schools, but it's like, people like, I don't know if they just think that like. there's a minimum wage and like I don't know you don't have to work a million hours a week like I think they just think that's like normal it's like no like this like Yeah, and so that's Deed's I know that's a pretty really hard bad for me abuser <laughs> of what that do you say unpaid. Deed's a pretty bad abuser of that unpaid overtime. So I think there's just kind of an accept, like, there's just a, like, this is how it's always. And that's why I just kept reemphasizing, because no one in our bargaining unit makes nearly enough money for un for mandatory unpaid overtime. Like, Right. yeah, we might be exempt and we might have to balance and all of that, but there's a diff, even I think like our contract makes, at least in the intent, it's not, it, you're, when you hire someone in an exempt position, you're not expecting them to work 60 hours a week. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people don't like to admit that, you know, um, they don't want to stand up and say they're overworked, but, Right. but Yeah. th that's It's also a real, just, that's a real oh, thing. go ahead. No, it's Yeah. a real thing that we're going to have to deal with. And it's like, you know, this is one of the ways that they're getting around some of their budgeting concerns. But if Right. they could spend some of the money that they spend on bullshit, they could spend it on their folks. You Right. know, I mean, Yep. it's really what it comes down to. I do have to run because I've got another meeting, but nice Yep. job. Um, let's look at doing this again in a couple of weeks when Cool. your calendars allow. And, um, you know, maybe we can reach out to some more folks. I'm really hoping that it got some sign-ons. That's why I kept putting it in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> so, appreciate it. I think we'll probably see a couple for sure. We'll see some for sure. I think, All right. you know, like, yeah, Deed does a lot of direct service. So I, it's pretty, like, it's not surprising to me that pretty much everyone who said something was either VRS or DDS. Um, to be fair, DDS is its own bucket of worms because it's like a federal contract. It's, Mm. Right. it's so weird how they like fit into, I mean, they don't even get access to the den regularly, for example. Mm. They have to Yeah. go through the special workaround. Um, 